Hallelujah. Uh, today the teaching is about counseling and tomorrow too. This is very important and it's not easy to learn. In two sessions, it's very hard to learn. Um, but you try to put it in your memory, um, try to remember the most important part, and it could change your life totally. Um, now the difference between counseling and teaching and instructing uh, are that, you know, teaching is telling them how to do things, how to do things. And instructing is teaching them, telling them what to do. You think about it. From childhood, your mother, your father tell you, work hard, study hard, do this, do that. When you keep hearing that, do you get much motivation to do what they want you to do? If they just say, okay, clean the house, wash the dishes, wash the clothes, wash the windows. Every day, they, uh, if that's all they say to you, would that motivate you to do the things he wants you to do? That it become, can become a burden. And so we need love. In the family, there is love. If a healthy family, when the family members care about you, uh, sees that you're important, helps you, and uh, try, to, try to bring you up, and all, if they do all these things to you and make you feel happy, and then you will have the motivation to do the things at home. But even then, when your family members care about you, when they tell you to do the things, it's better to do it like this. Uh, wow, uh, we, we are one family. Let us serve each other by cleaning the, the windows together. Uh, let's, uh, and it's wonderful that you are cleaning the, the dishes. Uh, it's wonderful that you are doing this. That way, that, does it feel better? Yeah, it feels much better. So, in counseling too, if people just tell people what to do, there, there is a misconception. That counseling is telling people what to do. Then it's like, now you are not treating your wife well, uh, so you should change. This is what you should do. That way, then it becomes instruction. Any time when it is instruction only, people would rebel against it. The concept of counseling is to listen to them, listen to their needs, listen to their feelings, and and uh, comfort them and accept, accept them and uh, make them feel uh, important and accepted and guide them to find a solution. So counseling is not just telling people what to do. If we just tell people what to do, there can be rejection. And even when we serve God, if we do evangelism or we visit some Christians, uh, members of the church, if we just tell them, uh, you should go to church t uh, tomorrow, uh, you should read the Bible, you should pray. When we do that, if it's just instruction, it will make the members feel, well, you visit, it's just telling me what to do. But if we say it like this, God loves us very much. When we follow God, there is much blessing. And every day we can have strength and have joy of the Lord. And then when we pray to Him, every day we receive power. And then when we gather together in the church of God, that we can encourage each other, and then we can bring people to Christ, and then when we serve God, God is happy with us. Now what I'm saying is I put in a lot of grace together with the uh, instruction to what to do. This is very important. For yourself too, when you talk to yourself, don't just say, I have to read the Bible today, I have to pray. Now many Christians think like this, Oh, today I have to spend time reading the Bible, I have to spend time praying, I have to do this, do that. That way, then it, you could become dry. So every day we need to tell ourselves, God is, love, God is loving me, God is caring for me, God is helping me, and I have potential to become a great person. And, and uh, God will raise me up higher and higher. 
So we need that every day for ourselves and for the people around us so that people have motivation. And so it's true for marriage too. So many marriage, instead of saying, now, instead of saying encouraging words, they sometimes use instruction. And then the words is a condemnation, accusation. Now many husband and wife would say, you didn't wash the dishes well. Have you heard those kind of words? You didn't, you didn't clear the garbage. You didn't do this. You, you always are unhappy. You never do what I want you to do. Now this is worse than instruction. So we understand that in the realm of the law, there are different kinds of way of saying it. First, there is grace. Grace is, what is grace? Grace is telling God loves us, God cares about us, God will help us, God is blessing us. And then words of grace to people would be, you are important to me. I like you. I, uh, I want to do something to help you. You are precious to me. This is a gracious word to people. And then the law, there are different uh, levels. Uh, the best is to, that you mix it with uh, the grace, with gr the grace of God. And then to tell them, when we serve God, then God will remember it and He will bless us and He will give us strength. And then our whole life will, will blossom and we can bless more people. So the best way is to guide them what to do and let them know when we do this, God is very happy with us. And then the next will be instruction. We need to instruct. And when a group of people, when people uh, uh, are willing to do it, then it's, it's okay to instruct. Okay, if, when we gather for worship, we have to uh, take this uh, stand there, we have to set up a tripod, we have to set up the drums, and we have to get ready. It's okay. Uh, when people are ready to do it, then it's okay. But when people are not ready to do it, and then we keep telling them what to do, then it's not, it's not uh, mo uh, the most encouraging thing. And then also there is uh, teaching. Teaching is, uh, we need to have teaching. Teaching is good when people are ready. When people are not ready, what can you do? Put in more grace so that people are motivated to learn. When you live in the love of God, your whole life will be raised up. Your whole life will, you know, you, you, you'll be a better person. And you can serve God better with power. And you can bring people to Christ. And God will remember all the things of God, that you have done for God. That put in the motivation and then teach them. And then they are more motivated to learn. And then the worst way to use the law is condemnation or punishment. You know, now the Bible does have that. The Bible, in the Bible, uh, judgment and condemnation and punishment are for people who don't obey and don't follow the Lord. Uh, the Bible doesn't use that to, uh, Jesus did not use that to instruct the disciples to follow Him. He did not say, if you don't do it, I'll punish you. Jesus did not say it like that. He says that if you give a cup of cold water to the little ones, you receive, uh, by no means, you lose your reward. So the Bible doesn't give, uh, you know, condemnation and uh, criticism to the people who are following God. This is only to warn people who are not following God. Hallelujah. So we distinguish the use of the law. So at home, we want to have more, more words of grace. But people are not willing to say it. Why? People are not saying, it's so nice to see you. I'm happy to see you. You're wonderful. You're doing well. Why are people unwilling to say things like this? Because a lot of times people think, if I do it like this, I'll spoil you. I'll spoil you and you won't do anything. Actually, the best kind of leadership is the kind of leadership that will let people know how important they are. What they do is contributing to the church, to the group. What they're doing will raise up their own life and it's, it's pleasing to the Lord. This is, a, this is the best kind of leadership. And then people will follow you willingly. You have more people who like to come to church and like to come to the service where there's a lot of encouragement. With, now encouragement, some people misunderstand. Encouragement 
For some people, they mean you have to do this, do that. That's not encouragement. That is telling, instruction. And encouragement is saying, God loves you. You're doing well. God treasure you. God is using you. That's encouragement, telling them good things. The grace of God to encourage them. So I hope you remember this. Now, if you remember this, it's very, very good. That you avoid words of condemnation, judgment, punishment, accusation to people, and you would use you know, words of encouragement saying you're important, you're precious, and then, uh, now we have to instruct, uh, what I mean is guide people how to change. We have to guide people, and the way is to ask them, uh, how do you think we can improve on the relationship? What can we do? Uh, is there any way to help you and your wife have a better relationship? That's guiding, asking questions. It's better to ask questions. And the same thing for you too, to ask your, your family members and say, what can we do that we can improve our relationship together? And now, a lot of times we can, if we do it ourselves, that's a good example. That's also motivate people to change. If we are nice to them, then it encourages them to change. Okay? Now, the first thing I want to say is, are bad ways to counsel. Bad ways to counsel. Here are some bad ways that you want to avoid. The counselor makes the people feel accused, condemned, hurt, despised, or controlled. To make them feel accused, condemned, hurt, despised, or controlled. Control means you have to do this, you have to do this. That's controlling. If you don't do this, you're not a good Christian. We can, we can do better by telling them. Um, when we do this, it will improve on the relationship and, and your marriage will be better. So that way, it's better than, you know, so we never want to use accusation. Um, now, actually, like yesterday, I talked about sins. Remember, talk, I talked about how to handle our sins that we, uh, how not to sin. And I talk about the destruct, destructiveness of sin. How sins are destructive. And I, and, I, and I describe how we should repent and turn away from our sins and then be aware of sinful thoughts that come into our minds and then take care of it right away. But in the whole process, if you notice, I did not condemn you. But I did let you know what sins are. I tell people, depression is sin. Worrying about things is sin. Not being joyful is sin. Not living out the, the love of God is sin. Not living out the joy of the Lord is sin. And when we know that we have sins, then we want to be careful because sins are destructive. And notice how I say it. I don't say, it. you don't have joy. God doesn't like it. <laughs> you have no strength. And you can never serve God. And you're too lazy to serve God. That is pointing at people and telling them, you are wrong. So we have to be very careful. When we preach, when we teach, when we guide people, we use more words of encouragement. Now when I say, depression is sin, and we want to think about the good things of God, and to avoid negative thinking, negative emotions, and then we can enjoy God's presence so that we have more and more joy and peace instead of being depressed. When I'm saying like this, do you feel condemned? You don't feel condemned. I'm just telling you some fact. I'm telling you some fact without condemning you. Have you noticed the difference? I did not condemn you. I just let you know what are sins and how we can change. When people say negative things to us, we know right away. But when we say negative things to people, we might not know right away. So we have to be careful. Uh, how, uh, what kind of the law are we using? Which, in which way are we using the law? Okay, the next way bad counseling is, bad counseling is when the counselor does not listen to or respond to the feelings and needs of the counselee. Doesn't listen and doesn't respond and doesn't accept the, the needs and the feelings of the counselee. Um, listening is 
very difficult. It's very difficult. And we want to do some exercise of listening, you know, uh, later today. Um, why is it difficult? For instance, if someone says, oh, my life is miserable, my life is difficult. I, I'm unhappy. Uh, my husband hurt me. When we hear things like this, it's very natural for Christians to say, trust in God, pray to God. Don't worry about Him. Have you noticed that? People like to say things like this, just immediately instructing. Instead of saying, oh, I know that when your husband are not, is not nice to you, it makes you unhappy. Does it sound very different? Yes. When someone hurts you, it doesn't feel good. It makes you feel discouraged. That way you are hearing the feeling of the person. Some people may say, then you are spoiling the people. Then people want us to say positive things all the time. But let me ask you, when we, the Bible tells us to love, husbands love your wives as Christ loves the church. Does loving the wife make, spoil the wife and so the wife will, will just not do anything? Does loving spoil people? God's love, does God's love spoil people? God's love doesn't spoil people. It's when people only have the love of God and doesn't know the law of God. We need to have the law of God. We need to guide people to follow God. And actually, you notice I did talk about the law a lot, how to, what to do, how we can, you know, um, uh, take care of our sins and our problems. And also even now, I'm teaching you what to do. This is the law. And, but I'm saying in a way without condemning. So we need to do some exercise of listening. When someone talks, we listen to everything. It's very easy to miss, I tell you. It's very easy to miss. Uh, it's very easy to miss the details. It's very easy to miss the feelings, the needs, and the body language. It's very easy to miss these things that the person express. Um, if you have been hurt by someone today, if you have been hurt by someone, and then, and then you tell the people, oh, today someone is not, was not nice to me and yelled at me. And, and then the person says, oh, then how, uh, how, how does it make you feel? How do you feel now? When you hear this from someone, or someone says, oh, that must make you feel unhappy. How does it make you feel when someone says, talk to you like that? It will make you feel you are listened to, that you are important. Then he knows it's not, the, not easy. Have you noticed in Pharaoh that someone is crying? Because usually women cry more. And uh, because she has lost uh, a beloved one, maybe the husband, lost the husband. And then what do people say to her? Don't cry, don't cry. Your husband is in heaven. Have you heard this kind of words before? Now, it's, you know, this something it, it's correct. It's, it's no problem. Now listen to this. Another way of saying it. I know you are very unhappy that you miss your husband. You miss your husband. You love your husband. He's so important to you. And you feel very unhappy right now. Does it feel different? What is different about this? Then you know the person's feeling. Let me ask you now. If, now, I know nothing like that serious happened to you today. If someone in your family gets very sick today, or even loses his life today, and then you're crying, and then we tell you, don't cry, don't cry. Will the sadness go away right away? If you say, don't cry, will the sadness go away? It won't. But when you say, oh, I'm sorry to hear that you, you lose your family member. I know that must make you feel very unhappy. How do you feel? Better. You feel better. You feel the person understands you and accepts you. Now, he has done nothing to relieve the problem. But you feel there is someone in the world that understands your feeling. 
Now this kind of communication draws people to you. If you can talk like that, not only talk like that, you feel the feelings of people. You feel their feelings and then you can respond to them. Then you have the potential to be, to be a counselor. If you cannot feel the feelings of people, now some people it's very hard to feel the feelings of other people. And some people it's very hard to find ways to say things that make people feel happy. Then you need to learn. You need to learn before you can be a counselor. Okay, let me finish the bad ways to counsel. And the third bad way is despises the feelings of the counselee and just wants to achieve the goals. That means I just want to achieve the goal that the person will change his life and follow God and obey God and preach the gospel and serve God. Now that is your goal. Now we all want that. We all want that. But if this person, if this person is being hurt by people, he's very unhappy, and then you say, serve God now. Let me ask you, if you have just been yelled at by your family members or someone, and then we tell you, let's go to do evangelism. Do you have the motivation to do it? We don't. We need the healing first. So we have to understand, accept the feeling of the person, and then, and then gradually help them. If they are here, and this is where you want them to go, this is where you want them to go, and they are here, you cannot pull them up there right away. You have to take them step by step. Accept the feelings, understand where they are, guide them to talk about themselves, guide them to talk about their feelings, and then respond to the feelings with acceptance, and then help them to understand their feelings and understand their needs, and then gradually guide them to, to, uh, to work on the problem. It takes time. If something unpleasant happened to you, does it take time for you to get over the, the problems? Like if someone hurts you, can you get over it right away? No. You find that in the middle of the night when you wake up, you'll feel pain in the chest, right? Have you felt that way before? You feel pressure here? So it takes time. And when we understand people, you draw people to you. And as Christians, we want to do that. And as ministers of God, we want to do that. And you notice that he, Jesus did pay attention to the feelings of people. That Jesus said to the woman, 12 year, uh, have the bleeding problem. He said, woman, uh, he said, daughter, be at peace. Your faith has healed you. Has healed you. He called her daughter. And he said to Zacchaeus, come down, I'll come to your home today. And he said to the woman who has committed a serious crime, where are the people who, uh, who, has, who are accusing you? Instead of asking her, do you know you have sinned? Now, we, we can talk to people like that too. But we first let them know we care about the situation. She cares about the people who accused her. And then he asked her first, where do people accuse you? And then he said, neither will I condemn you. Go and sin no more. So he, he guided them. He did guide her to follow God. But he first showed that he cared about her being condemned. And when Peter said, uh, when Jesus said, he will, uh, Peter would deny Jesus three times. Instead of yelling at Peter, saying, you're no good. For three years you'll follow me and now you're going to deny, deny me. But Jesus said, I, I have prayed for you. I know your problems. I have prayed for you. Imagine that when you heard that, when you have sinned, and Jesus said, I have prayed for you. I know your problems already. Does it make you feel good that He has prayed for us, that you will not lose your faith? And then when you turn back, strengthen your brother. So we can see that Jesus cares about the feelings of people. And, and the Bible also said, the crushed, um, you know, I don't know the word in English. The weed, uh, the Bible doesn't use the weed, the willow. The crushed willow, he would not. Uh, and I, I don't know the exact wording, but he would not crush anymore. And, uh, and the flame that is going to burn out, he will not blow out. That he will be nice to the weakest person. When someone is very, very weak, 
God will still encourage them. Even people who are in sin, God will still touch the heart and encourage them to repent. And the love of God can cause people to repent. But we want to tell people the law too. But we tell in a way, God has loved you so much. God has blessed you. So we want to follow God and then God's blessings will come to you more. That way you are putting in the gospel, the grace of God when we tell them what to do. Okay, another way, the wrong way, is the counselor is affected emotionally and then he gets angry and then he says, you're crazy. How can you do that to your wife? Or he takes parts, he takes, uh, he's partial and is take, uh, take, uh, take side and say, and, and always help the wife and say, you look at you, you're not like a husband at all. You, you're not, not a man even. How can you treat your wife like that? When you do that, the man will run away. Now when I counsel people, both the woman and the, wife, uh, and the husband like me, they said, you have listened to both of us and you know our needs. You know our feelings, and then re you respond to us, and then both of them are willing to change. And I found that many times I've, in counseling, I've seen marriage very in terrible condition. And then when I accept the feelings, then they have the motivation to change. They notice someone understand them. Very often, it's a woman who asks for help, and a woman says the husband doesn't listen to her. Now that's true too. But when I listen, I found that the man would say, the wife is too wordy. She talks too much all the time. And so I don't want to listen to her. And then when I hear that, I say, yeah, I understand that. I know that is hard. I did not condemn the woman. I just say, it is hard for you. And then the woman says, the husband doesn't listen to me. And then I said, no, yes, I know, that's difficult. But he doesn't respond at all. That's difficult. So both sides, I will listen. I will not condemn the other side. I just accept what they say, accept the feelings. Okay, and then if the counselor is affected emotionally, and then would respond with negative emotions or despise, you're no good. Now, it happens very often. Many people in the church have received negative emotions and criticism. And, and then uh, people say, you have no love. You don't have the love of Jesus. You're not even a Christian. <laughs> when people talk like that, does it help people? No, it would take people away from God. So we have to be very careful that we are not affected emotionally, except that people are sinners. So if they have sinned, it is their problem. My job is to guide them, to understand, uh, to accept the feelings. And then, Another wrong way to counsel is they only cares about the counsel leader and does not guide them to grow. Just listening, caring, comforting only and doesn't guide them to grow. We have to guide them to find out the solution, the problem, the solution and guide them to find ways to solve the problem. And then wrong way is to give wrong or unbiblical advice. For instance, oh your husband's like that, you better leave him. How can you live with someone like that? <laughs> that is wrong advice. Uh, or biblical and biblical advice. Oh, for someone like that, oh, it's just disgusting. Oh, you just cannot live with someone like that. That's wrong advice. And then uh, the wrong way is to teach in a monologue way. Now, it's very easy for Christians to do that. Just keep teaching, keep talking in a monologue way. Just talking one way, no listening, no communication. It's very important to listen to the other person. And you notice that now, I'm teaching because I, this is in class, so I keep talking. But have you noticed my eyes? I keep looking at one of you, one by one. I'm, in a way, I'm seeking response from you. I am interacting with you, even though, you know, at this point, uh, I'm, also you can ask questions, you know, and anytime you can ask questions too. Then I'm not just, talking, talking, and keep talking, keep talking, and never stop, never give you a chance to think. So I let you absorb what I'm talking about. And then, in a wrong way is the counselor crosses the boundaries of a counselor and build up a healthy relationship with the counselee. What it means is like, 
Very often when one person like uh, counsel a, someone who is divorced and the person is hurt and, uh, and then gradually the counselor spend more time with the counselee and then uh, and, and do more than counseling and then build up unhealthy relationship with the person that the person become reliant on the counselor that is not healthy that any moment when you found that the relationship with the counselee if there is dependency then the person depend on you then you always want to see the person because sometimes a counselor want to see people who ask for help so when we see someone ask for help we feel good we feel good someone needs me now some people they don't feel need at home so if someone needs them then they feel happy so they, they're happy to see the counselee because the counselee need them and then the, another word, bad way to counsel is the counselor gossip about the counselee. After he hears about it, then he tell other people about this counsel, counselee. Then that is very bad. When we hear things about people, we have to keep it secret. We have to honor the person's uh, privacy. Uh, so, okay, these are bad ways. I go through this very quickly. First, it's, a bad, it's wrong to accuse, condemn, despise, or control. And then it's wrong to not to listen and or not to respond to feelings and the needs of the counselee. And neglect despises the feeling of the counselee and just want to achieve the goals. And uh, it's, it's bad when he is affected emotionally and respond with negative emotions. And uh, it's wrong if the counselor only cares about the feeling and never guide the person to grow. Just every time, oh, let him cry, let her cry, and then care about her and comfort her and did not guide her to grow. And then when he gives wrong or unbiblical advice or teach in a monologue way, then it's teaching, it's not counseling. When he crosses the boundary and then when he gossips. So these are wrong ways. <coughs> Um, now, the next point we want, want to talk about is the counselor has to prepare himself. The counselor has to be a healthy person. If you're not healthy, what happens is you could get depressed when you counsel people. Because you find that people are hard to change, people don't follow God, and then you, you give up and you say, you know, many counsel, uh, people help people emotionally might himself get depressed and then commit suicide. Some people who, some counselors commit suicide themselves because they, they lose hope, they, they're hurt. So as counselor, we have to be healthy. The first thing is, so these are counselors need to prepare yourself to be healthy. First, the counselor needs to have strong relationship with God so that he has joy, peace, and confidence and the wisdom from God that he has to have this relationship with God. Second, he needs to be aware of his own needs and his needs has to be taken care of before he can counsel people. For instance, if the counselor has marriage problems, he knows how to counsel people, but he is not willing to change to you know to love his wife or care about his wife so he's he has hurt feeling inside and then when he comes so what happened is he will put himself in the position of that counselor <coughs> he will say oh your husband is so terrible my husband too is very is terrible oh i feel so bad and then <laughs> the counselor keep crying <laughs> Because he, 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 she herself has been hurt. Or, or the person has so much hurt feeling that the person doesn't have confidence, doesn't have healthy self-image. So he needs to be healed, peaceful, and have confidence and healthy. Well, then they say, well, we might, might, might be never be able to do it because we're always weak. But let me tell you, if you are going toward direction of being healthy, you can help people. You don't have to be perfect. But you're taking care of your problems. 
A lot of people deny their own feelings. They deny the hurt feelings. They have problematic relationship with a spouse and they deny it. They say, I have no problem. They ask them, I have no problem. Everything's okay. When people always talk like that, sometimes they, they do have problems and they don't refuse to face it. And then number three, the counselor needs to learn from every counseling session to take care of similar problems and learn to counsel better. Counseling it, in counseling is very easy to make mistakes. It's very easy to miss the points. So every time we learn from it. The, the most important part that many people miss is the listening. Eh? To guide instead of teaching. And then number four, that he is bold enough to admit his fault when he does not counsel well. When he did not counsel well, that he is bold enough to admit his fault. That he say, I'm sorry I said that to you. I'm sorry. So that's being a, uh, being healthy. Okay. Now, what are the goals of counseling? First, we want to, the goals for the counselee and the counselor, that he himself and the people he counsel, to have healthy relationship with God. So, because the relationship with God will bring about health in every other area. When a person comes close to the Lord every day, then he will have strength every day. And then he will be helped in every way. And number two, the goal is to have mental health. What does mental health mean? It means the mind is positive, that the person is not affected by negative emotions, he's not depressed, that he's peaceful, joyful, that is being healthy and have positive thinking. And then body health. That if a person doesn't take care of his body, then his body will not have health. And when the person doesn't have body health, then it's hard for him to have mental health too. So we need to have, take care of our, our, our body. And then interpersonal relationship. Many people don't have healthy interpersonal relationship. Many people, uh, they cannot relate to people, they don't have good friends. Let me ask you, how many good friends do you have on earth? If you are in trouble, can you think of one or two or three persons that you can talk to? Then you have confidence. And also, when they have problems, they also will come to you. That you have this healthy interpersonal relationship. Now sometimes, as ministers, sometimes ministers don't have many friends because they have to help people all the time. And we need to learn to build up relationship with people. But do not, remember this, do not build up unhealthy relationship with church members. As when we serve God, Sometimes people like this, I've, I've, seen, I've seen people like that. They need friends. So whenever they help someone, that person becomes his friend. And then he will tell the person about his problems. Oh, I'm so unhappy in my ministry. Oh, I, I'm unhappy, I'm sad. Then he would hold on to the people who are close to him. And this would destroy his ministry. That we don't want to tell church members our uh, the problems in the church we don't want to tell them uh, you know our negative emotions we want to take care of them, that ourselves and as uh, ministers or counselors we need friends outside of the ministry that we have friends the spouse is the best friend so it's very important to have a good relationship with the spouse if not then you need to find other ministers or counselors uh, to be your friend. Now, we can have friendship with people in the church. We can have friendship with them. But don't make them become the people you complain to or dump your sadness to, that they don't become like that. Be friendly with them, they can, you can play together, you can pray together, you can work together, you can have fun together, it's fine. 
But as far as your ministry problems, they are not your, they are not your target of sharing. You can talk about general things like, please pray for me, uh, please pray for me to have more wisdom for ministry. That is fine. But when you say, oh, uh, someone hurt me in the congregation, and I feel very bad. Oh, now I'm very unhappy. Or something like that, you cannot share with the church members. Because when you share with the church members, what happens is, they will have negative feelings toward that church member. And it could create great problems. Okay, so it's very important that we have a healthy interpersonal relationship. And to have healthy interpersonal relationship, we need to be able to share about ourselves in a reasonable way. You don't share about every, every secret in your life. I've known people like this. The first time they know me, they will tell about all the secrets, all the problems, because they, everyone they see, they tell the problems. That way, they won't have good friends. Okay? And then, uh, number five is environment and healthy lifestyle. That some people don't have a healthy environment, and what, mean, what it means is they don't have a healthy family, they don't have a healthy group of friendship. We need a healthy church, healthy fellowship group or cell groups, or a group of people that we can share with. And that we create a healthy environment that we relate to each other. And also the home environment is healthy to us. And then good church life, uh, group life, and then also has meaning in life, life. That as counselor, we help people to have meaning in life. Many people don't have meaning in life, but help them to have meaning in life that they can you know, serve God and they can bless people. Okay? So we ourselves need to have health in every area. Okay, now let me go through this health, uh, one area. We need to have healthy, healthy relationship with God. We need mental health. We need body health. We need interpersonal relationship, uh, good health, uh, interpersonal relationship. We need healthy environment and lifestyle, healthy, healthy group life, church life, family life, and has meaning and purpose in life. Okay, now I talk about the steps of counseling. What do we do? Now, it's not necessary to go through every step, but I'll tell you some, uh, some of the possible steps. The first step is praying to start the counseling session, asking God to guide and to help the counselee to be able to cope with the problems because uh, the person needs the help of God. Uh, it's not just learning something, it's he's willing to, we're trying to change life. In counseling, we're trying to change life. It includes spiritual counseling, marriage counseling, uh, personal counseling, is to help the person to cope with this problem and change his way of behavior. Change, change his way of uh, uh, thinking uh, and his emotions. Okay, and then second, Build up a caring and trusting relationship with the counselee. That there is good relationship. That the person feel comforted, feel comfortable. In a ministry too, we want people to feel comfortable in a ministry. That people, uh, they, they are helped in our ministry. So they, they like to be with us. They get help with us, okay? And then number three, listening. Now this is a very important part, and we'll practice that today. But I'll talk about the few things about listening. First, pay attention to a few things. These few things you have to write down. The content, what the person says, his way of expression. For instance, when he talk about it, he might be very angry or frustrated or unhappy. So notice how he expresses. So his way of expression, his emotions, his body language. What it means is, for instance, when he talks, 
He is, his lips are shaking, his hands are shaking, or his eyes are red, or he's crying. All this are body language you want to watch. Anyone you talk to, you try to watch the body language. And when we're preaching too, watch the body language of people. For instance, when people are not interested, they will sit back like this. They're not interested. But if, for instance, if someone you like, uh, you just think of, you know, if you have someone, uh, uh, when, you were, when you are at the age of 20, and someone is interested in you, and that person is talking, will you sit like this? You would listen, attentively, uh, attentively. So, the body language, and um, emphatic words, some of the words he uses. For instance, he says, so, uh, he's always uh, complaining. He complains about the things I did. So, then the word is complaining. So, the person is complaining, is telling about the other person complaining. And the action, action is, for instance, when you counsel them, they, they turn their head away. That's an action. And that's saying something that he doesn't like to listen to you. So you pay attention in listening. You pay attention to the content, the way of expression, the emotions, emphatic words, body language, and action of the counselee. Okay? And then second point, in, in listening, we want to know the condition, the concern and the needs of the counselee without judging. <coughs> what does it mean to understand his condition without judging? The goal is to understand everything about him or her because every person is different. Every person suffering they have different feeling, different thinking, different experiences. So we listen to that and understand the feeling behind. And sometimes, you know, the feeling are not expressed in words. They, it will, they will show it. For instance, the facial expression, they're unhappy, it shows that they're unhappy. So that's uh, to, to try to understand the underlying feelings without judging. For instance, someone just had a divorce and many Christians have a tendency to judge and say Christians should not divorce. That's true. But he already has a divorce, so what can be done? We're still trying to save his brother or sister. So, without judging and saying you, have, you are hopeless, you have no hope. <coughs> and also understand and accept that the condition of the counseling uh, it's natural for the counselee to feel that way. Now, what I mean is like this. For instance, someone, you know, like yesterday I talked about how not to be affected by people, how emotions, how we can have healthy emotions. But this person come to you, his emotions are out of control. He's very sad, unhappy, or angry. And in our mind, we'll say, I don't want to be like that. I don't want to be emotional because of other people. This our teaching, not to be emotional because of other people. But when we do that, then we can understand the person. It's very important to understand this person is at a different level than we. If they are at the same level as you, then they don't need counsel. They are in a different level. So they are very sad. They are affected by the conditions. So we want to listen to them and accept that in their condition they will feel unhappy. Accept that. It's natural for them to feel unhappy because they, they cannot overcome the problem there. And then, number three, when we listen, we also manage our own emotions that we're not affected by the person, by sadness or by anger. For instance, a woman counseling and a woman do not get angry and say, your husband treats you like that, I want to beat him up. Then <laughs> he's losing control of his uh, emotions. Uh, or he get angry with this counselee. He said, it's no use to counsel you, you don't listen to me. You're always having problems. 
then he cannot control his emotions. And then D, concentrate in the listening, do not touch, and do not try to find a way to help the person at that point. It's very important. At that point, we just want to discern. Say it with me. When we listen, we just want to discern. When we listen, we just want to discern. We are not trying to find solution. We are not trying to find solution. Let me ask you, have we sometimes listened to someone and then the, when a person is talking, then we are trying to find ways to answer the person. Have you noticed that? We're trying to find ways to answer to that person. Then we are already trying to find a solution. When you try to answer, then we lose concentration. Yeah. And we also will be biased that we have our own opinion. So when we listen, we don't want to have our, we don't want to put our opinion on that person. We just want to discern. Because once you judge the person, then you are judging according to your level. For instance, someone just committed adultery and comes to you. Of course, he has sinned. He has sinned. It's something bad. But you just tell the person, you have sinned, you're terrible, repent. Now, this person must have a problem. If he can repent, he doesn't need you to tell him to repent. When we counsel people, people sometimes, for instance, have you counseled drunkards, people who are drunk? I mean, who drink a lot, who hit their wife? When you counsel people like that, are they willing to change? They're not willing to change. So if we try to change them right away, they won't change. So we have to lead them, accept their feelings, and then, you know, know that. Uh, because, for instance, the, uh, the drunkard said, oh, I'm... I don't, I don't feel happy about my wife, I don't like her. Now, you would say, this is wrong for you to, not to like your wife. So we don't want to judge. And we want to accept the person and his condition, he doesn't like his wife. But we want to change that, but not now. When we listen, we just listen how the person feels and, uh, and discern this condition. Uh, and then we want to guide the person to gradually understand the situation. Okay? So concentrate in the listening and do not judge. And do not despise. And try not, and do not think of a way to help at that point. Later, we'll think together with the counselee. And then avoid unnecessary questioning. For instance, someone uh, were just uh, uh, they were just hit by the husband. You don't have to ask every detail. We don't have to ask every detail. We just need to know uh, whether this person is hurt, uh, whether um, this person uh, the feeling. We don't have to know all the necessary detail. One one important example is when someone has being sexually abused. We don't need to ask, how did he abuse you? We, did, we don't need to ask. We don't need the detail. So uh, we don't want to ask unnecessary details. We only ask what is necessary. And accept the counselor's weakness, his sins, his emotions, his foolishness. Avoid criticizing. Uh, you will say, He's such a sinner, how can I not judge? When you judge, then you cannot help the person. So we accept that the person has problem. Accept his weakness, his sin. And then do not teach too much at this point. It's better to guide and listen. And, and just to guide him to think of, gradually to think of ways to resolve the problems. Okay? Now, so these are uh, the important things when we listen. Let, let me repeat again. First. We want to pay attention to the content, what it says, the way of expressing his emotions, his body language, and action and emphatic words. And then we want to know the condition without judging. Um, and we want to accept that in that condition, it's natural for the person to be like that. 
and we want to manage our own emotions when we listen, and we concentrate listening and do not judge and do not try to find solution at that point. And then, E, avoid unnecessary questioning, and also accept his weakness, his sins, his emotions and foolishness. Uh, ex uh, avoid criticizing, and do not teach too much. At that time, just to listen. Okay, we're going to have an exercise right now. Who is willing to come out here uh, to share about something that has happened to you that has affected you? Okay, thank you once again for teaching us. Um, yes, I once had a problem whereby I was genuinely desiring to know something. You generally. Yeah, desiring to know something. to know something. Yeah, to know about something. Yeah, like, for example, like the dates whereby uh, they're having it's an activity, a certain activity. Yeah, like I wanted to know about the event, kind of. You want so, to know about events? Yes, I wanted to know about events at that time. Like, it was an event that was happening. Okay. So, I wanted to know about it so that I can be able to, more like, uh, I can be able to schedule my, 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 what can I say, like my schedule, my daily schedule, so that I can be able to attend the, the event. So now it seems like um, there was some misunderstanding uh, with the person that I was talking to. Okay. Yes. To an extent that uh, the person, uh, truly I didn't know how the person was, 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 was thinking in his mind. Okay. Or mind, yes. So now the situation was, um, the person wanted me actually like uh, never to do that again. So, and then also the person, uh, uh, the person doesn't want you to do it again. Yeah, like what? Like to inquire, kind of. Like inquiring, because actually, what I was doing, I was inquiring about the event that is coming. Yeah, you were inquiring about yes. the event. And the yes. person doesn't want to inquire about it. Yes, it's, it's like somehow maybe I've offended the person. Maybe I've offended. Offended? Yes, okay. the person. So now, something that I was, I was unable to understand was uh, the person wanted me to come to, to him so that I can. I can explain why I did that, and and explain actually why you inquired. About yeah, that yeah, and actually the person just concluded that I'm wrong, and he uh, say it again. Yeah, the, the, the person, the person whom I went to meet. Uh -huh. Yes, uh, it's like he has concluded already that I'm on the wrong side. Okay. So which made him not actually to listen to me why I was inquiring about it. Okay. Yes. So the person that the person just talked. Talk, talking and talking and then from there I had to say okay because the person just wanted to talk is fine so I just like, the hmm? person just wanted what the person just wanted to talk like yeah okay. like yeah just talking and talking without even giving me the chance to actually say why I did that and okay. then I, and then at the end of the day the person was like yeah yeah we clear on that I said by all means yes it's fine even though in the inside I was wounded I was bleeding I was like this person, why is he doing this? Why is he not even giving me the chance to actually explain why I was asking about that, about the dates and and yeah and stuff like that? So so that was that. So from there, it left me with a wound. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I was deeply wounded because uh, I, I was saying that you know, in uh, somehow I found like. I didn't express myself. Like I felt like the person did not really understand why. I mean, why I did that. And to make the matters worse was that uh, the person misjudged me. You see, it's like uh, the person is giving me a certain image, I like giving you a, a certain image, an image. More like uh, the person he has a negative mindset, mindset concerning me. So that was something that. Yeah, at that day it really affected me so much. Yeah. Okay. So that was is something little that I can say. Yeah, I, it, it had affected me at a point in time in life. Okay. Yes. So that was just the the, the whole thing. Okay. Yes. I'm sorry to to hear that. Um, now, now the first thing about listening is do we have interest to listen to you? That's we need need intense interest to really pay attention to people. Now, um, so we, this is an exercise. 
together. When you heard him talk, what, what was his feeling when he, you know, what happened? What was the feeling when he, when, when that happened? He Did you hear? Was hurt. Was hurt. Uh huh. He was okay. Disappointed. Uh huh. Disappointed. Now, uh, now, at this point, I want to also ask clarification because I don't understand. So I want to. Ask. Sometimes in listening, we all also can ask questions too. Um, now, when you ask about the schedule of the events, why would it make the person unhappy? I, I, that part I don't understand. Um, okay, even me too, I can say I didn't understand why the person was very angry. But I think maybe somehow the person felt like, it's more like, uh, I wanna, maybe I just want to uh, like involve myself. I truly, it's just that I didn't understand why the person was very angry. Okay. Yeah, so, I, I truly don't know, I truly don't know. You don't, don't know. know why? Okay. I, yeah, I truly don't know why. Okay. So, you were just asking about the schedule of a, a, an event, what time, what happens, right? Yeah, yeah, but actually, just to be in general, I just wanted to know like the dates. More, yeah, more like the dates. The, yeah, the dates, like, we're, yeah, we're having this, so I just want to know about the... It's, it's more like a fear that that's an event is coming. So, so now I wanted to know like uh, the dates, yeah, whether it's going to be happening so that I can prepare myself in advance. Okay. Yes. Okay. Now, now can you tell, now he said he was hurt. I didn't hurt. Can you uh, describe other feelings that he had at that point? He did not use the word. He was wounded. He said he was wounded. But he just now he expressed another feeling of his uh, underneath. So that needs attention. Really, first thing in counseling is, are you interested in people? If you're not interested in people, you cannot do counseling. If not interested to help people, you, you cannot do counseling. So, have you noticed something that when I asked him, and then he said, he said he did not know why. He was confused. Yeah, right. Very good. So he was confused. Why the person would be angry about this thing? Okay? Now, how can you explore this more? What kind of questions can we ask to explore this more? Okay, now, um, we want to explore, you know, um, not details, but how it affects him. Not details. What I mean is, it's no use to know a lot of details. So after that, how does it affect you? And how long did you feel, you know, did you feel bad for a period of time? Um, and also, does it affect your relationship with that person? And so I'm asking details of how that affects him. Okay. Uh, okay, um, because the person is, uh, I can say, is someone that I respect. So I just had to, uh, to embrace the spirit of, uh, what can I say? Um, yeah, whereby I just, I just say, you know what, I'm, I'm just lower than the person, so let me just let it be. So it's more like I consider the person to be more like my role model kind of. Uh, I said, uh -huh. this sentence. Just now what you said. Yeah, it's just that I was saying that I was, and okay, I was able to just let it go. Let it go. Yeah, just let it go. And then I said, okay, uh, either way, I can't argue with this person. Either way, also, let me just respect the person as, uh, yeah, as he is. And then uh, it's life. There are, there are misunderstandings. So it, it happens. So I just have to let it go. Just let it go. Yeah, but, yeah, but, it, but the wound was still there, even though okay. in my mind I was saying that, okay, I'm just letting it go. So it was, it was like we say, healing takes, sometimes it's a process. Yeah. So it really is like, yeah, so it's a process whereby I just have to, to, to like heal inside. But, but in my mind, in my soul, I said, you know what, I have to move on with life because okay. yeah, this person is someone that I esteem and there's no how I can bring about fights. It's not, it's not going to do any, any so I just uh, say, I let me just let it go. Okay. Yes. Okay. 
So, um, now, now, some of you might ask, why do we counsel? Why do we counsel people? Uh, counseling is helpful in evangelism, in helping people spiritually, in helping people to have healthy, uh, healthy mental life. Uh, and when you interact with people, it's all necessary. So I hope you all get interest to learn it. It's very important. Now, what he just said right now, the reason why I just said what I said is because I noticed some of you, when he was talking, then you just look down and seem to lose interest. Uh, that is one big problem of a counselor. A disinterested counselor cannot be a good counselor. So one bad counseling is someone who is this not interested in counseling. That is bad counseling. So we have to have interest in people and know that this is effective. Okay? Now, he just talked about a contradiction. Have you heard his contradiction? What was his contradiction? Anyone want to say? What was the contradiction? Yes? He said that he let the thing go, but the wound was still there. Right, okay, very good. So he wants to let it go, but he's still hurt inside. So there's the contradiction. So now we want to explore that. We want to find out more. So when we listen, we find out more. And so you try to let it go. At the same time, you feel bad. It's just that at that time, like I was feeling bad at that time. At that time? Yeah, just that somehow by God's grace, I managed to overcome it. Right, okay. Now, in this case, of course, you know, I can see that. So at this point, this thing has passed, right? So this thing has passed. Now, but what if at that time he talked to us? And then he said, I want to let that go because I respect the person. But, but inside me, I still hurt. Does it feel good that way? Then you want to let go, but inside you still hurt. No, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel good. Yeah. And so it, uh, did you lose sleep? Um, of course, uh, yeah, it's, I mean, of course it was, it was, the, it was bringing about discomfort. Uh -huh. Yeah, I was very uh, discomforted. Okay. Now, what other questions can you ask to explore more? One very important question. When you see the person... Have you person, forgiven the person? Pardon me? Yeah. Have you forgiven the person? Now, uh, wait, wait, wait. Now this question, listen. Have you forgiven the person? What is the underlying... the underlying um, motive when you ask this question? When you ask this question, have you forgiven the person? What is the underlying motive? The underlying motive is to check if he has forgiven, that he has some spiritual problem. Now we want to do that too. We want to do that too. But at this point, it is just listening and find out about his feelings. Too often, we are too anxious to try to change him. Let me ask you, have you been hurt by people? Sometimes when you hurt, how long do you feel bad? You could feel bad for how long? Right. So it ranges from how long to how long? With me it only lasts longer. Pardon me? Louder. With me it only lasts as long as I don't see the person it goes. Okay. Now, when you don't see the person it goes away. Now, let me ask you, actually, when you just, what you just said, express something in you. The, everything we hear, we try to listen behind. So you don't see the person, then it's okay. But what if you have to see the person? The thing is, with the encounter, in the midst of the encounter, I'll have a problem. Speak louder. <clears throat> it's okay, you're close to the camera, but you still speak louder. <laughs> okay. Now, in the midst of the encounter, like for example, when I'm encountering the situation, like if it happens right now, I'll have a problem, okay? 
particularly probably I won't feel good about it or feel angry and hurt about it. But the moment I step out, I don't see that person. I begin the healing process, and the next time I see the person, it's like nothing ever happened with the person. Okay. Um, now, it's good that you have disability, uh, that you feel, you know, that it's like nothing. Um, let me ask you, when you think about some of these past experiences, do you sometimes still have hurt feeling inside you? No, not really. No. Not really? Okay. Now, uh, I, when I hear what you said, you know, I know that it's, it's good that you can do it. And if you can do it completely, I congratulate you. Then you are very successful. But many people say what you said. What they meant is like this. When I don't look at a person, I'm okay. I then I don't think about the person. And they try to bury the feelings. They try to suppress the feelings, but actually the feelings are not taken care of. And sometimes some people, now some people can really handle it. It depends on the, in the process. Some people can handle it, but some people actually suppress the feelings so much, gradually they lose the ability to feel. So now, we're counseling, listening to him. But when I heard what you said, I want to uh, invite you to think. Now, I, I turn now to him. <laughs> I turn now to him, but I'll come back to you. Think of the different people that have hurt you. And then you try to forget. And then you don't see the person, you feel okay. And then you said, when you see the person again, now you don't feel anymore. But let me ask you, have there been experiences that you think it's all over? And then when you see the person, again some unpleasant memory comes up. Some unpleasant feeling comes up. Or some fear comes up that it might happen again. Or some distance that comes up, that you might feel a distance with that person. Yes, I recall it happened sometime last year, in February. There was something that had happened in 2007, and then it left me with a bad feeling. I got angry and frustrated, and then I spent, I think, about eight years without seeing the person. And after eight years, the first encounter with the person the feeling came back again. Okay. And the first thing, at the first sight, the feeling came back again. And I remember I, I found it hard even to go greet the person. It was hard for me to go greet the person mm -hmm. because it's like that day, the day it happened, the day I got hurt, it was like that day that atmosphere was being recreated again mm -hmm. before me. Okay. But now, do you want to come out here and talk about the story? Because what you talk about is really something hidden feeling, but I can go back to you. Come, come forward. Is that okay? Thank you. <laughs> I want you to all pay attention. I want you all to pay attention to what he said. This is a condition that needs counseling. Okay. Yeah, as I was saying, I, I got hurt, it was in 2007, uh -huh. sometime in, in May. And what happened was from there, I got separated from the person. I got angry, I was angry, I was hurt. To an extent where, if it was within my capacity, I would have reacted to that and done something. But I recall at that time, because I was too hurt, I decided to separate and isolate. Never see the person, never come close, never call, never talk. For at least six years, minimum six years, never talk to the person, never want to know about them. Mm -hmm. But in process of time, I decided to go heal, forgive, and forget. Mm -hmm. That was the process I did. And it was good, I felt good, I never knew. So the person, in fact, after doing the healing, forgetting process, I made up a meant to talk to the person, call the person, 
I was able to talk to him once or twice, if I recall. But then after about eight years, when now I had the opportunity to see the person in face in person, that feeling and the whole bad mood and, and atmosphere came back again. You know, such that it was so hard, such that I found it hard to go greet the person and talk to the person. And that's how it happened. So I found that I'm going through what I've been through in the past, the past eight years. It was more like it has just happened, just a moment ago. Mm -hmm. So th that was how it was happening. So back then, at, at that particular time, I had to deal with that situation. Mm -hmm. I had to remind myself, you have overcome this. I had to remind myself, this is a thing of the past. But to tell the truth, the reality is, at that point in time, it was like the person just committed that offense. That was the feeling. There must have been one very difficult experience in your life. That experience stayed in your mind. And when you talk about it now, how do you feel? It's, it's like nothing to me now. It's nothing to me now. It's, it's like nothing to me now. Because, as I said, at that point in time, I had that. Okay, I had the feeling, the anger, more like it is coming back again, it is running. But I had to remind myself that I've overcome. I had, I had prayed about it. I had engaged God about it. So the healing process was complete. It was just more like when the devil tried to make you understand you haven't overcome. But I had to get back to me and say, you know what, God has helped me overcome this thing. It's a thing of the past. And at the end of the day, in that particular day, I ended up going to the person, being the person, remember hugging him, and I'm quite happy for him. Because the person is actually my stepbrother, so we, we reconcile them, that they never really surfaced. So, yeah. Okay. So, this experience is quite an experience in your life that you remember it and it affected you for that period of time that you thought that you could forgive and you did try to forgive but when you saw him the feelings came back up again so that was that let you realize at that moment when you saw him again, that you let you realize the feelings. There were some hidden feelings inside you for years that you thought is over, but it's still there. Now, what I want to say is, when we want to counsel, we don't want to first go to the step and say, "Then can you really forgive him now?" Then we are just wanting to get to the end. We want to listen to the person and accept that this is a very unpleasant experience first. And the second is, he was trying, you were trying. And you, you use different method. But at the moment when you saw him again, you found that you really haven't, not all the feelings have been handled. So we see how people can have hidden feelings for years and even though we try to handle it, it's still there. So being able to handle all our feelings in the past is a, very, is a successful action. It's a successful action not many people can do. And this is something we need to learn to handle our own lives and handle people's lives and accept them. And when we listen, don't try to teach him. We can guide him, but first let him realize the feelings. Now, so when you saw him, what year was that? How many years ago was that? And then I'm, I'm trying to, now I'm demonstrating, trying to follow on this, this thing. Now, you, some of you might think, that's too long. I don't want to go through this. It's too troublesome. Let me tell you, if your feelings have not been taken care of, each one of us can have many underlying hurt feelings, 
still affecting us. That's why many people are not free. So don't think that you are totally free. Many people think we are totally free and I know no unforgiveness. Actually many of us have those. And when we listen and accept without condemning, what happens is I can bring up to help the person to understand his feelings and, and handle it. The goal is to handle it at the end. But at the beginning we don't go right away. Did you read really, did you really forgive? Then we are just skipping the step of listening and responding to the feelings. Now in your mind you might say that's is it necessary? Many people will say, is it necessary? Um, I don't know if you have this experience or not. Then you were hurt by someone and then people just talk to you. You have to forgive him. And then in, inside, you were not able to do it or not willing to do it. And the person just say, you have to forgive him. If you don't forgive, God will not forgive you. And you just feel pressure instead of having the motivation to... <coughs> Uh, having feeling accepted and handled it. Mm. So this is very, very important. Do not rush. When we handle our own healing, do not rush. You have to go through each one, one by one. When you are doing simple things or when you are praying, when you think about the people that have hurt you, take care of it step by step. Okay, let me, now I, I'm going to demonstrate. Let me see the time. It's already... It's already time, but I'm just going to do it for five minutes and then finish. Uh, how many years ago was it that you saw him? That that eight, years. eight years ago. Yes. And then now, in the eight years, and after that now, uh, the, the time when you saw him. So eight years before that, he hurt you. And then you saw him. And then eight years from now is the present time, right? That was eight years ago that you saw him, right? Yes. Okay. Now, after you saw him that time, after that, did you keep thinking about that for a while too? Yes, I did that because I remember I saw him at night, so I couldn't talk to him. I just kept away until I think about early in the morning around 7, that's when I was able to go talk to him. But I, I arrived in the scene of the place where he was at around 2 in the morning. So from 2 until 6, I managed to talk to everyone else but not him, until 7, but not him. Though we crossed paths many times, he, part, he came by, I made sure I used the different route, different part, he doesn't see me. He, you mean he made sure? I made sure, sure, yes. You don't yeah, meet because I avoided you. Because by then I found that I was having that feeling I had some eight years back. So I had to deal with it. I wanted to deal with it before I can go talk to you. So when you deal with it, it was difficult, right? What did you have to go through? Okay. Well, it was difficult, but it wasn't difficult like when I had to deal with it previously. Because by then, that was last year when I met him, by then I had already overcome it. So it was more like the situation is trying to recreate itself. Like you say, the feeling was trying to resurface, to come back again, to say, you still have, you haven't forgiven, you haven't dealt with. But I know for myself I had dealt with because during the time when I was dealing with, I even made sure I called him. It's just that I didn't see him in person, but I called him over the phone, we talked over the phone. Now, you said the feeling surfaced. You said the feeling surfaced. That means there was some feeling underneath and then it surfaced. And very often, people think they have handled it. But if it's service again, that means it's something it still hasn't been taken care of completely. It's that you find that human feelings is hard to heal. Uh, we have to accept this. Do you accept this for yourself? Is it easy to overcome feelings? It's not easy, right? 
So to have complete healing and to be total free, is it easy? It's not easy. You have tried. But I can see that from what your description, that I can see that that was still affecting you. And even though you tried, that it was not complete healing. Even though you think there was complete healing, but there was incomplete healing. So uh, in order to arrive at a complete healing and then to, to be totally free and accept the person as he is and to be able to be nice to him, it's quite difficult, right? And when we have incidents like this, one, of, one after another, piling up, what will happen? If you have incidents like this, one after another, so this thing that has affected you, that have you noticed that some of your feelings were suppressed for a while? The suppression of feelings. Yes, it's true. And then, sincerely speaking, if you try to have feelings like that one, or oh, incidents like that one after another, the reality is you can't contain it. It will just burst out of you. You will find yourself able to react to it. Mm. That's just the reality. Yeah. So, I think it's best you deal with it yes. and try so much to heal from it. Yes. Tell me that. Okay, very good. Let me ask you this question to let you think about it. In the process, do you think sometimes you, you suppress yourself? That you try not to pay attention to your feelings? That, that you become losing contact with your feelings? That instead of handling it so that you are totally free, do you sometimes just say, I don't want to think about him. I don't want to look at him. I don't want to think about this incident. Has this happened to you? Okay. Yes, it has happened before and, and that's what the, the story really made me realize that there are times when you think you have dealt with something but there's some part of that thing that you have suppressed. Okay. Yes, because it really exposed me because something that I thought I had dealt with I have at least three years before, before that resurfaced and then I noticed I have to deal with it again. So there are some feeling or there are some emotion or there is part of the story or feeling that are still inside that are suppressed and not dealt with. But now as I stand, because from there I noticed, I decided, you know what? Whenever something happens, what I do is to make sure I walk on, if I'm angry, I accept I'm angry. I accept I'm angry, I deal with that, and I sincerely go before God and tell. That's one thing that I do for myself. That's why I was telling you. Now what happens when somebody offends me or something gets me angry or offended? What I do is to make sure I avoid confrontation. I get out of sight. And the moment I get, I don't see the person, I get out of sight, what I do is, I just go before when I tell him, I am angry, I am hurt, whatever feeling that I have, I, I just lay it out before God. I'm angry, I'm hurt, I, I feel like confronting somebody, I feel like doing this, and then in prayer and going before the Lord, I found that God has a way of just mm -hmm. make sure yeah. me the other side of yes. the story. Because that's how it is. Mm -hmm. Most of the time, I'm hurt, I'm angry, somebody said something, but I don't even know why and how it happened. And, but I've noticed when you go before the Lord, God just finds a way to mm -hmm. say something to you. Yes. That just makes this thing to be something mm -hmm. that doesn't mm -hmm. even happen. He just heals you from mm -hmm. that. That's right. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I hope when you listen, you will see how people's feelings is complicated. Mm. Uh, now, we don't have time already, but I just want to c conclude this. Uh, from listening to you, I, I would still want, you know, if I have time to talk to you again, I would still want to ask you, did you really forgive or, I mean, you try to forgive, but at the same time, did you suppress your feelings so that maybe now, you cannot be as free as before to be totally free of negative feelings. So, I, uh, uh, when I heard you, what you said, I 
I kind of feel um, that first some of these things might have hurt you and this hurt might affect you in some way. And then <coughs> you might be suppressing some of your feelings. It's affecting you long term. Now, uh, that is something I need to talk to you about to find out. But I want to say this. What is the long-term goal of our counseling? Long-term goal for me and how to, for, for the wisdom of counseling someone who has been hurt, how can we be forgiven? Uh, to me, he said, he said one secret, the presence of God, that it will bring healing. But another one I found very helpful is to think of that person who hurt you. Actually, he probably has hurt many people. He probably has a habit of hurting people. And he's probably had been hurt by many people many times. So he get used to hurting people. That is his habit. So when the person has been hurting people, now, if I want to do this counseling, I want to first go through him. him. But this is at the end. I will tell him, help him, help him. And uh, so this person, he has hurt you, but he has hurt many other people and he has been hurt by many people. So this person is really having a miserable life. He doesn't have many friends. It's difficult for him. It's difficult for you, but it's also difficult for him. So he's affecting your life and he might have caused you to have one decision. I listen to you and I notice you have one decision. When someone hurts you, you need to walk out. You cannot face the person. And then later, after you handle it, then you can come back. So that's, that's one way. You, sometimes we have to avoid the person for a while to handle it. Uh, that's one way. But also, another way, if we can learn to say, this person actually is more miserable than I am. So even when he says that, I, I'm more blessed than he is. He's more miserable than I am. I can accept him and I can bless him and forgive him. Yeah. That way, yes. we don't take the hearts yes. next time when someone hurt us. Yes. Now, but another way is suppressing could be dangerous because what happens is gradually we lose the ability to feel, lose the ability to laugh and to enjoy life. So there's something, if I have the time with you, we want to find out if you are able to really freely laugh or behind your laughter you still have some hurt feelings behind. Now sometimes people are like that. They think they already handled it. But behind all this there are still hurt feelings. That's why I cannot freely laugh. So that's something for you to think about. And to be able to really have compassion on this person and forgive and bless the person and say it doesn't matter, I don't have to be hurt by the person. I am precious, I am important in the sight of God so I can rejoice, I can accept my feeling, I can accept my hurt feeling. At the same time, I know God loves me so much so I don't have to be hurt. To go through that process, we have to help the person to accept and understand that. And for each one of you too, to have complete healing, you need to know that you have not suppressed your feeling. If you have suppressed your feeling, you cannot laugh like me. <laughs> <laughs> it's so good that you can have the joy flow out through you freely. Many people, it's unhappy, it's suppressed. So I hope you're facing your your feelings and handle it. And uh, you're very brave to share about that today. <laughs> you're very brave. I admire that and I appreciate you. And I I like to see you go on a path of complete health complete healing, that you can totally accept the person and say, this person is more miserable, he needs help, he mm. needs God, yeah. and I can look at a person and say, oh, I want to bless that person, mm. I want to completely forgive the person, yes. then you have complete healing. Mm. Mm. Then you think of the person, every time you think of the person, you want to, you want to really try to do things that bless the person, then you really have complete healing. So, do you understand? Complete healing is not easy. 
And how to achieve that is to accept how we feel and how to handle the feelings in the process. <coughs> and not just to rush, have you forgiven him? And then he said, okay, I forgive him. Let's kneel down and pray and then forgive him. And then in the process, many feelings are suppressed. Do you understand the process, how important it is? And I hope you really go home and clear some of these feelings in the past. And then tomorrow when we come again, then you can say, yes, I begin to handle this. Sometimes it, it, it takes longer time for some people to handle this. Okay, but time is late already, so we cannot continue. You know, I know that it's hard for some of you to go home in the dark without vehicle here. I, 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 God bless you all. Amen. Amen. God bless you. <laughs>